So hello everyone. So yeah, my name's Seth, and I've been spent the last six to eight months working on creating new river networks for, for Ireland. So in this presentation, I'm just going to go through a bit of the background, um, the problems we came across, the software we used, how we validated the river networks, um, and then a summary. So back in 2005, we created, um, I'm old enough that I was helped to create the first set of river networks for Ireland in yeah, 2005 for the Environmental Protection Agency. So they manage all the, the environment, so they have an interest in the river network for things like runoff and pollution. So we created this back in 2005 using vector mapping from the National Mapping Agency, the Ordnance Survey Island. Uh, and that data set was, was made in 1992, so it was based on 50,000 scale mapping. So that's um, an example in, in the background. And then in 2014, the National Mapping Agency came out with a new vector data set called Prime2. So this covered the whole of Ireland, um, or Republic of Ireland. So everything had a feature. It was a lot more accurate. Um, they changed the, the projection to a, a new, more accurate projection for, for Ireland. So the EPA, um, in the last couple of years, started doing projects where things like sinuosity and accuracy of, of flow became more important. So they decided to switch from the current networks that are in use in about 10 active systems that are continually running. Um, so they want to kind of update all these systems to use a more accurate river network for more accurate modeling. So in this example here, you can see the, the old river network. It's kind of the jaggedy light blue line. And then the new network is the, the green line. So you can see there you've got the, the more accurate sinuosity. It lines up better with the aerial photography. And in some places, kind of the, the old mapping was 15 to 20 meters out um, in terms of accuracy. So in this slide, you can kind of see that there's a lot more river channels are mapped. So the light blue is, is the current EPA river networks. Um, and then you can see here that um, there's a lot more kind of first order streams. So the purple mapping is, is what we're going to use to, to create the new river networks. So a nice thing about the, the new data set is that it's not just line work. Um, they also have polygons for the water. So you get widths. So this was a key thing for the Environmental Pet Protection Agency is to have the river widths because then you can do more calculations on load um, and flow. And again, sinuosity and, and morphology. So the new data set didn't just have lines and nodes, but it also had um, the polygons. So each polygon had a center line, so you had an association between, between the two features. So that was kind of the background as into to why we were going to switch to new river networks. Um, so then the next step was to, to actually turn them into proper networks where we could calculate flow and direction. Uh, so we ran into, we're running into, because this is ongoing, um, a few problems. So I'm just going to run through them, through them here. So the first one is that um, the, the data is highly accurate, but it's, it's not connected. So a lot of the digitizing is based on aerial photography. So sometimes a river would go under a road, and there would be no river line there. Then the river network would break. So in this example, this is one of the hydrometric areas. The bits in red are disconnected from the bits in green. So the first step to turn these into proper connected river networks was to, to turn the red bits green. So basically we had to go in, find all the gaps, and connect them together. So we started creating a, a kind of a toolkit um, using the web, using open layers, so that we could quickly come in and connect um, the broken bits. So in this example, just connecting underneath the road. This is a nice simple case where it's kind of obvious where the flow goes. Um, but there were a lot more complicated things, so we had we have about 60 reference data sets. So we have mapping from the early 1900s, which was highly accurate, kind of black and white old mapping that would show kind of the original ditches and flows. And then we have a DEM, so we get the kind of the, the generated flow directions. So we use the combination of those to try and find out where, where the, if there were gaps, how we would connect the, the data together. Uh, another cause of the gaps was, was when the, the water flowed through a lake or a, a water polygon. So we had to connect these, so none of the lines would be joined together. So again, we created some tools, so you could just click on the polygon. It would find all the, the inputs to the water polygon. It would connect them together and create a, a skeleton, and then you could manually make the skeleton look a bit, a bit nicer. But the idea is always to make sure that you have the fully connected flow from all the, the sources down to the sinks. 
Um, one of the other things that complicated matters was the, there are lots of underground connections, water connections in Ireland. Um, so the water would disappear underground. Um, the Geological Survey in Ireland, um, they're responsible for kind of mapping these, these areas, but they have theoretical connections. So these bits in, in kind of pink, they show where theoretically two water bodies might, or two rivers might connect. So for big chunks, we tried to work out or just add in theoretical lines just so that we had the connection between the two. So again, this would all then lead into things like you could work out if, if pollution's coming in at one point in the river network, what will it affect downstream or what will happen upstream. Then the other major thing we had to fix was the, the flow direction. So the, the original data set, it's nice and highly detailed. Um, everything's fully connected at nodes where it is connected. But the, the line direction is, is random, so it just follows the, the digitized um, direction. So the data would come in like this. And one of the things we had to do would be to correct the flow so that all the arrows are pointing, pointing downstream. Uh, so there's a, a set of Python scripts that would, would kind of go from every source down to the sink and then flip all the lines around so that everything was pointing in, in the right, right direction. Um, and then, yeah, once we managed to connect stuff up and we got the flow together, then we could start um, working out things like Strahler order and the connectivity. And then you can do the calculations, like if you click anywhere on the river network, you can get all the connected segments upstream, or you can get all the connected segments downstream. Uh, one of the things that we, we didn't count on, so we did a, a pilot hydrometric area, but then when we came to the national rollout, um, we found out that there's actually too much data. So we thought we would be connecting all the gaps, so we were aware of those, but what we weren't aware of was loops. So basically, there were connections where there shouldn't have been connections, and there were things like 10 kilometer loops going around, which hydrologically doesn't sound correct. So there was a huge exercise you can see here. This is just one hydrometric area, and all those red bits are, are where there's a loop. So in some cases, like a braided river, um, a loop might be might be valid, but um, as far as I'm aware, loops like this shouldn't really be, um, shouldn't be there unless there's, there's flooding. So in these cases, we, we manually found like, the best place to break, to break these loops for the bigger loops, so we could use that based on the current river networks. Um, so it was handy to have a, a reference data set that's already been validated for, for 15 years, so we knew where to break them. Um, but there were so many that we had an automated approach to break the, the smaller loops. So it was based on um, the stream order or the associated polygon width. So we'd remove the, the smallest bit of the, the network that we could. Um, we don't actually remove anything. We just have a flag so we can bring these all back. So when people go out in the field and say that the, the networks are wrong, we can, we can bring these back and then remove different bits of the network. Uh, so again, we had to create a whole tool set. Um, that bit in the background is probably the worst bit of the river network. It looks like an error, but these were all designated as streams. I think they're meant to be tracks. Um, but 99% of the data was, was very high quality. But when we ran into this, um, yeah, it caused uh, a million loops to appear in that, in that channel and kind of crashed all the tools. So um, we had some manual tools so you could deactivate the edges, um, again, through a web UI. So an editor could come in and, and break those. And rather than removing whole edges, there was also a tool that you could split edges, so you could remove chunks. Um, so you could put in, you want to break 50 meters here, and then just click on the map, and it removed that part of the network. So again, this was all to, to break the, the loops. And one of the other issues was, was around the hydrometric area borders. So we, we have the country split up into 40 hydrometric areas. Um, but again, these hydrometric areas are based on the original river network. So we assign, them, we assign the edges to each hydrometric area, but obviously there's a lot of edges that cross borders. So there was a whole process of trying to find out um, which edges should flow into to which hydrometric area and breaking things along the border. Uh, fortunately, there'd been another mapping exercise where they created kind of newer catchments. Um, so like the jaggedy black line was a newer catchment, and this actually mapped up with the, the more accurate data. So again, there was a, a tool set around transferring edges either dynamically based on how many edges they were connected to. Um, or we also had tools where you could just select edges and transfer them from one hydrometric area to, to another. And then obviously there's another bigger border on the island of islands between, between the north, uh, north and the Republic. So 
basically the, the National Mapping Agency's water stops at the border, so they stop mapping at that point. But obviously, if you want to do any analysis on those hydrometric areas, so the ones kind of with two colors, uh, you're going to be missing a huge chunk of the river network. So I guess in, in Europe, it's probably a, a bigger problem, but um, there was just one border to be, deal with here. So we're either going to try and get um, data from Northern Ireland that's at the same accuracy, and then try and stitch it together, or use the current river networks. So um, there'll be a lot less data there, but at least there'll be some indication of of strata order and things will be vaguely correct around in those catchments. So once we, we can connect everything for a hydrometric area, we have to, to validate it. So there's a few different techniques we had to, to validate the, the networks. The first one is um, monitoring stations. So the, the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency, has 10,000 monitoring stations around the country. So these are places where people go out and, and take a sample in the water, or they could be automated sampling points. So these monitor kind of key areas of the network. So let's see if there's a, a factory or something, they might put a monitoring station downstream of it. So with this point data set, we could find out which bits of our new network were missing. So that they were in the old network, but they're not in the new one. Um, so for example, if they were 15 meters from the, the new network, we'd go and investigate, and we might bring in the current network. Um, so there might be bits missing from the new network, so we'd have to, to add those in. So these are kind of key parts of the network that, that they're interested in monitoring. So, so we wanted to make sure that they were available in the, the new networks. Um, after we completed each hydrometric area, we kind of got all the, the summary stats. Um, where we could generate kind of automated images using WMS. Um, and then we could do things like compare the, the catchments from the current network with the new network. So we get all the edges that connect down to a sink. So a sink is where the rivers meet the sea. And we could just compare the colors on the, the current network with the new one. And sometimes that would highlight that we'd, we'd had some connection that should have been broken and everything would be the wrong color. So it was a kind of a quick high level visualization of the, the new networks. And similar with the flow, again, if we'd connected two bits of the, the new network incorrectly, you'd see that there's a, a massive river that in the current network was a first order stream. So obviously there was an issue and then we'd have to go in and, and investigate. And yeah, as I say, the loops was probably the, the most problematic issue. So there was a whole tool set of all run through the web. So you could, you could check for loops, you could check they were removed um, and you would highlight them on, on the map. And then obviously at the database level, um, we have a lot of checks around making sure that a line has a node at the start and the end. There's not overlapping geometries. Um, every sink has some sort of connection. Um, every edge flows into a sink. Every edge has an upstream source. So there's lots of stuff you can, you can pick up at the database level. OK, so in, in terms of the software, um, I get a, a map server mentioned in here. So at the back end, we're using map server to serve out about 80 or 90 WMS and WFS layers. So these could go into, the, into a web viewer. We had a, a SQL Server backend for the database. And then in the middle, um, all the geoprocessing and things was done using Python. So there are lots of different Python libraries. And then these were wrapped up with a, a Python web API. And then the front end is a, a JavaScript single page application. So based on open layers and XJX and GeoX. So kind of that's... Um, that's uh, most of the tech stack, so it's split into the front end. Um, the middle section is all the Python libraries, and then the back end is, is Map Server and SQL Server. So we, we put it in a web editor so that we could have multiple people editing um, river networks at the same time. Um, and it was also, it was also useful because we could have permalinks. So any section of the network, we could zoom in. We could get the permalink, so if there was an issue, we could then send the permalink to the EPA, or there would be other stakeholders who are interested in the, the river networks. So they could then have the permalink, and then they could give their feedback on, is there an underground connection here? Does it look right that we're breaking this loop here? So having it all as a, as a web application made it a lot easier for the sharing and, um, and, and showing issues between different stakeholders. As I say, yeah, the, the Python web, web API, so it's a fast, um, fast API interface, so there's a lot of Python scripts in the background, and then it's all wrapped up in a, in a, a nice API. And one of the more interesting things on the back end was creating these skeletons for the, for the water polygons. 
Um, so this was the side kit. Um, has a nice feature where you can create skeletons for a, for a polygon. Um, initially, it didn't work because the polygons were too detailed. So there was a process of um, making sure the input points were kept, but then getting rid of points, um, simplifying the points in between. And then you could generate these skeletons. And then using a graphing library, you could get the shortest path between all the points, and that would connect everything up. So this was probably one of the bigger locks in uh, Western Ireland, and one of the more complicated uh, features. Then if you, if you had the time, you could then go in and modify those lines so it would avoid islands and things. Um, but yeah, the key thing here was just to make sure that all those bits were then connected to, to downstream rivers. Uh, all the Python scripts would, were running through WebSockets so that you could get interaction between the, the geoprocessing and the web. Otherwise, you'd be sat there. Stuff would be happening for five minutes in the background. You wouldn't really know. So the, the use of WebSockets made it so that you could basically have the outputs of the Python scripts coming into the web front end so you know when things were, had finished processing. And there was a couple of um, libraries, Python libraries that were open sourced as part of this project. So there's a, a library called Cascade that we released that can create the Strala or Shreve stream order using pure Python. So it would quickly create the, the stream orders for the networks. And a second library that we've also been using for, for roads is Wayfarer. So if you've heard of the Network X library, it's a graphing library. Um, it's used to connect nodes and edges. So it's used for things like seeing who's connected to who on Facebook. Um, but the Wayfarer library takes that and turns it so that you can use it on geospatial data sets. And that gave us all the things like getting all the paths from source to sinks um, and running it all through quickly through the, through the Python backend. Um, and then we also had um, some additional components um, on the JavaScript front end that were released uh, as a map view. And then we also had to export to uh, Arc, ArcMap and ArcGIS Pro because um, a lot of the EPA Users use, want this data set um, on their desktops as well. So there was some proprietary stuff at the end. OK, so just briefly in summary, um, we're about halfway through the project. So that's the progress. The bits, um, the bits where the rivers are done, uh, the two big ones, the, the Shannon, um, they were quite nasty. But they're, they're completed now. So hopefully it's going to be smooth sailing from, from now on to complete the other ones. Um, but yeah, one thing that's become apparent is that the, the new data set, there's a lot more data. So for the, Shan for the upper Shannon, so that's half of the Shannon, there's, um, there's 5,000 edges in the current network, and now that's gone up to 50, 55,000. And the length of the river network has gone from 5,500 kilometers to 11,500. 11 so in terms of reporting to Europe and the Water Framework Directive, there might be an exercise to remove some of the first order streams because um, Otherwise, the EU reporting people are going to get a shock when they see, they see the changes in the, the network. Uh, so yeah, the network's going to take a, a few more months to complete. To move all the systems across is going to take probably a decade, um, because there's a lot of systems built on this. But um, yeah, it'll be used not just by the EPA, but by other agencies in Ireland, so Irish Water, uh, the inland fisheries, so things like finding salmon breeding grounds, what's upstream from certain points, um, it can be used for that. Um, nutrient load calculations. Um, yeah, there's a lot of plans for the new networks from, from different organizations. So yeah, I'd just like to, to thank the rest of the team. I think some of them are watching, so um, I'll give a shout out to them. Um, and yeah, as I say, it's an ongoing project, so hopefully we'll get this done in the next few months. And that's everything, great, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Tess. Are there any questions? So I, I have a question with the second last slide, where you know the, the, the comparison, what was there and what is now here. That one. What are the authorities saying to that? <laughs> you know, it's um, it, uh, you know, is is that a big surprise, or did you expect something like that? Uh, we expected more data. Um, not every hydrometric area had that much of an increase. On average, there was about three times more length. So this is, this is an exceptional one, where it's 10 times more streams. Um, there's a lot of things like ditches around fields that have been marked as streams. But whether they're a stream the whole of the year is, is doubtful. So there might be a follow-up project to work out what's a ditch and what's a stream. Then you get into the, 
the difficult world of temporal river networks, like a river network in, in January is probably not going to be the same in July. Um, but that's yeah, a, a different problem. Yeah, and I think about the implications with uh, heavy rains, but uh, good. Any other question? Uh, hi. Uh, great presentation, I thank you. And uh, actually, I, I'm wondering what was the motivation to choose the backend based on Python, not, for example, on PostGIS? Because when you're explaining your algorithms, I'm always thinking about ah, how I would you implement in PostGIS <laughs> the same thing. But uh, this is just, uh, you have some uh, strategy for using Python, or just you are good at Python, and you, that's why you use it. Uh, yes, I like, I like Python a lot, so that's, that's probably number one. Um, the second thing, yeah, things like PG routing are great if you've got PostGIS, Postgres, but um, the EPA is very much a kind of Microsoft SQL Server backend, so it's nice to, to have a separate Python library. And I guess the second thing is we, we did a, a similar project based on Islands Road Network, where we took the Prime 2 data for the roads and we connected, those, well, we didn't connect them, they were connected. We had a lot of tools around routing and things already written in, in Python. So we're able to use a lot of the experience from, from that project on the roads and take it to rivers. So um, we had quite a bit of code that was nice to tidy up and open source, um, but code that's been around for, for a number of years. So. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Um, I might have missed it, but it's the data. Is that going to be available, publicly available, or is it internal only? Or? Yeah, it's a very good question. So the, um, the OSI, they recently changed the organization name, so the National Mapping Agency is now Talsha Aaron. Um, for the original river networks, there was a problem around licensing, but then they allowed it to be released as open data. So there's discussions ongoing that hopefully the same will be done with this, because it's based on their original data, but there's a lot of value added. But as it's going to be a national asset, um, it should be available for download, so people can download the whole network um, and re be used for reporting around Europe. So. Thank you. Any other questions? If not, um, thank you, Lorenzo. So then, if not, another round of applause for our three speakers, Seth, Andreas, and Hans.